Hi, this is Michael Buffer, and welcome to the Box Hard Podcast. Hello, everyone. This is Mikey Garcia. Yo, it's your boy, the odd guy himself, Malik King Scott. Hi, I'm Charlie Edwards. This is Fast Eddie Chambers, and you're listening to the Box Hard Podcast with my main man, Joey Kosmo. Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode 40 of the Box Hard Podcast, the Big Four Zero. I'm your host, Joey Coastman. I'm joined as always by Ayaz Sumra. Ayaz, how are you doing? I'm good, Joey. How are you? Very good, very good. Now, there's not too much to preview and review. There wasn't any boxing, well, too much boxing, I should say, on last week. And there's not too much to preview this week. Um, we're going to start with a card that took place over in... Jamaica. I think there was only one fight on the bill. It was a tournament called the Ray and Nephew Jamaican Contender Series. It was the final. Demarcus Corley, Demarcus Chop Chop Corley, managed to get the KO in round seven. So he's the champion of that that uh, that contender little thing. I'm not sure if it's like a prize fighter type thing. It's gone on over a few months now. It's all kind of took place in 2016. I've never heard of the tournament, but all the best to Demarcus Corley. He picks up his 47th professional win. And I think that that win there might put him in the mix for another shot, you know, at, at some kind of title, maybe not a world one, but but some sort of decent regional title or something. Uh, that's it for Jamaica. We're now going to go over to Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Top of the bill, Guillermo Jones. He picked up his 41st professional win out of 46 contests with a majority decision after six rounds. That's uh, that's pretty interesting that he fought a guy who had a record of 16 wins and 10 losses going into this fight with one draw. I thought he was going to really, um, you know, dominate and, and probably knock the guy out. But I was wrong there. Amir Imam was also on the bill. He moved to 19 and won with a TKO in the third round over Wilfredo Acuna. So that's a good win for Amir Imam. Also over in Pennsylvania, but not in the same arena. Top of the bill, Jamel Herrin. We'll be speaking to him very, very shortly. He's going to tell us about his fight. So I'm not going to get into it too much. But Herrin was down in round two and he was TKO'd, or should I say the referee called it a halt in round 10. Um, he was going into that fight with a record of 15 and 0. Denis Shafikov was having his 40th professional fight. So a lot of experience difference. And I haven't really seen the fight. I've only seen a couple of clips. But Denis Shafikov managed to beat Jamel Herrin and puts the first blemish on his record. It was a bit of an upset, I think. I mean, it was a bit of 50-50 for the guys that know boxing inside out. But Jamel Herrin was there to win that fight. And he's come up short on the night. But he'll be talking about that in a couple of moments. Also on the bill, Patrick Szymanski. We had Wilkie Kampfer on our show last week. He was taking on Patrick Szymanski. Well, Patrick Szymanski got the win. So I'm very sad for Wilkie Kampfer. You know, he was on the show last week talking about his loss to Jamal Charlo back in, I think it was October, November of 2015. And he's jumped straight back in with an undefeated prospect. And he's lost unanimously after 10 rounds so I'm, I'm I feel very sorry for him you know he's a really 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 nice guy anybody who listened last week will be able to tell you that Patrick Szymanski nonetheless moves to 16 and 0 Walkie Camphart now 21 and 3 I really hope he can get you know get himself back together and and come again now that's it for the USA there's only one bill to mention or one fight should I say to mention and then that will end the reviewing part as I said there's really not much to go over Over in Germany on Sunday, it was a strange one. I hadn't seen it announced up until the last minute. Erkan Tepper took to the ring to face Derek Rossi. It was a bit of a weird one. It was scheduled for 10 rounds. Erkan Tepper beat Derek Rossi over 10 rounds unanimously. So Erkan Tepper now 16-0. and And there's a lot of question marks over him, you know, about all the allegations and the drug testing and what have you. So... It'll be interesting to see what happens there. Derek Rossi, 30 wins and 12 losses, his record at the moment. Okay, that's it for the reviewing on this week's show. We're now going to welcome our first guest. Okay, now it's time for our first guest on this week's show. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Jamel Herring. Jamel, welcome once again. It's a pleasure to have you on. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be back. 
Excellent stuff, excellent stuff. Now, we mentioned earlier in the show, you know, the fight result, but we didn't get into detail on it simply because it wasn't shown in the UK. So I haven't actually seen the full fight. Could you walk us through the fight at all, Jamil? Um, I thought I was saying it was probably the most rugged and toughest fight that I've ever been. But it was, a, um, you know, I, I didn't come out with the victory, but it was a great learning experience in the end. And I'm um I'm still I'm, I'm pleased with the way um how I carried myself after the fight, so I can't really complain. Now I'd like to ask you. I know that you had a few offers on the table before you accepted the Dennis Shefikov fight. Obviously, Dennis was a lot more experienced than you in the pro ranks. It was his 40th professional fight, and he'd only lost two fights, both to world champions. What made you take that particular fight, Jamel? And are you at liberty to say who the other offers were from? Um. What made me take that fight was um, it was it was a challenge and I and I wanted to fight the best in the world. Um, I, I, I actually, you know, I could have took other offers, but um, it really wasn't really strong names, you know, so they were they wasn't um, recognized um, opponents. Um, before that, I, I, um, I was actually offered a fight with um, Javier Fortuna, but they um, they turned that fight down, just like um, a couple of other guys. They um, had turned me down as well. So um, I took with basically the best um, available offer on the table at the time, and um, that was Dennis Shevchenkov. And um, I, I knew basically a victory over him, with somebody with that, at that pedigree, would basically um, catapult me into um, to the world title rankings, and that's why I took that fight. Yeah, I understand that. I understand that. Now, do you wish you took any of the other offers? I know that obviously looking back now, it's you know we're looking back in hindsight. I'm sure you would, but was there any doubt at all when you was accepting the Shafikov fight? Oh um, no, not not really, not really. Um, I, I basically I basically knew what I was getting myself into. I mean, I knew about his his experience. I knew about um, you know, well of his two losses, which were um to um like you said, like you pointed out to world champions, and but um you know. I always told myself that in the end, for my boxing career, I wanted to go out as basically one of the guys that fought everybody and you know and didn't basically um, run away from any challenges. And so I'm really not um, upset with my decision at all. And um, basically, um, I'm just going to learn from it, and of course, I'm going to come back stronger. But I'm, I'm going to be better than I was um, in the past couple of days. Yeah, of course. I'm going to get onto that in a moment. Now, on a posit- on a more positive note, I know that you had a lot of nice good luck messages on Twitter from fans and other boxers. Um, I'm sure that you're thankful for them. And although although that you lost on the night, a lot of guys were saying that you showed tremendous heart and courage. Like I say, I haven't seen the full thing, but everybody's giving you credit. They're saying that, you know, you, you showed a lot of heart and a lot of courage and you was able to, you know, go into deep water sort of thing and, and swim through it, you know? Yeah, and, and and that's why that's that's, that's mainly, mainly why you know I have no regrets in terms of taking the fight because it basically shows where I'm at and where I can go further as a fighter down the line. You know, I'm I'm still in um, my prime, I'm still in good shape. Um, you know, the fight the fight got it got ugly in there and bloody, but um, in, in the end, you know, I didn't suffer any you know crazy damage or that that would basically that um threaten my career. And um, like I said, I, I learned, I learned, you know, that there are um, levels out there in the, in this game, in, this, in the sport of boxing. But um, I rather had got, you know, had learned that experience now than later on down the road. So, you know, right now I'm just, I'm going to just build off it. Um, I'm going to continue to work hard. As, as you see, you know, I'm, as you can hear from my voice, I'm in good spirits. You know, I'm not, you know, broken up, but you know, and, and I don't, I don't want anybody to have any sympathy or sorrow for me. You know, it, it's the fight game. You know, even even the best, the best that we um know today have um basically um lost time, you know, here and there. And um, I greatly appreciate all the support I have gotten, not only from my, own, you know, my country, man, but around the world as well. Yeah, I'm happy to hear you say that, Jamel, because of course, um. You're right, you know, it's better that it comes now while you're still learning the game, so to speak, rather than when you get to the top. For that to happen at that type of stage, it's, it can be make or break, where I think from this, you can only take good things with you now to the future. How important is it that you've learned something in that fight and that you can now take that into future fights? You you now, when you step in the ring now, you've got the confidence that you can go into deep water, into dark places during a fight, and, and you can deal with that. Oh, yeah, I mean, it's very important, especially um the fact that, basically more the fact that I lost to a guy that's 
basically considered one of the top ten in the, in the world. And I went without a doubt. Do I, yeah, do I, I mean, I went. If you, when you get a chance to go to fight, you see, I went, I went toe to toe with this guy throughout most of the fight, and I didn't want the fight to stop. I actually, crazy as it sounds, you know, as the fight was going along, I was actually, um, you know, enjoying a good scrap, <laughs> and that that's just basically the um the marine to me, and um. And I, as the fight was going along, there was never there was never a moment in my mind that I wanted to quit. If anything, I wanted to keep fighting fire with fire, you know, hopefully trying to, you know, break break him down mentally. But he's he's a tough guy, you know, uh, both physically and mentally as well. And um, you know, he, he, he showed he showed me a lot of things in terms of um what I, what, I, what I can work on and what I can achieve um down the road as a as a um pro. Yeah, of course. So what happens next for you now, Jamal? How are you feeling and do you have any time off before you get back in the gym at all? What's next? I'm 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 expected to speak with um, Al Heyman very soon. You know, we we spoke at, we spoke after the um after the fight. Um, I was a little bit down, of course, because you know it was um it was still you know the feeling was new. It's my first. It was still um, fresh, yeah. yeah, yeah, of course. still fresh, and um, you know, but I'm um, not gonna speak with him. He, he he was he was still very proud of me, and I even mentioned that I thought that you know I was gonna be put on the back burner for a while, but. He told me not to worry. That wasn't the case, and we plan on having a strong comeback. So, um, you know, with that, with him being behind me, you know, that that says a lot. And right now, I'm just going to enjoy the summer, of course. You know, spend time with my family, um, heal up. Um, even though, it's like me personally, um, me being the fighter that I am, I feel like I can get back in the gym, you know, this week. But you know, like I said, um, I, um my family needs me more, so I'm gonna take some time and spend some time with my family, but. You can um basically expect to come back in the, um sometime in the fall. Yeah, yeah. I was going to ask you if you had any idea of the return. Okay, so not. Yeah, that's good. That's good. It's good to take a little while off after something like that. You know, spend time with the all important people, the family, and of course, when the time's right, get back in in the ring. Um, I wanted to ask you about a couple of other fights that are taking place in your division at the moment, Jamel. Um, all of a sudden. Anthony Crawler from the UK, from my side of the water, he's just, you know, catapulted himself to basically, you know, the the number one guy or the number two guy in the division at the moment. He's taking on Jorge Linares, who is probably seen as the number one guy. What do you think about that fight? I mean, a lot of people weren't really giving Crawler a chance against the likes of Barroso, the likes of Dalis Perez. He beat both of those guys. He kind of shocked everyone. Even over here, no one gave him a chance. And all of a sudden, we're now taking him very serious. But he's in there against Linares, who's no joke. How do you see that fight playing out, Jamel? Um, let me just say, for starters, um, I believe a day before I fought, you know, um, I had reached out to um, Anthony, and um, you know, he, he showed me a lot of love in return. So you know, I got a great. I got, you you already know I got a great deal of respect for um, Anthony over there. And um, I follow his. I've been following his career a lot closely um, lately, and um, I respect I respect him as a, um as a fighter as well as a man outside the ring, and that's why I have a good spirit about myself because when I actually look at things that um that he's been through in his career and look at and like you point look look where he's at now, you know he he, he suffered more than one defeat, but you can basically put him up there as the top three in this division. And that's just my personal opinion. You know, you can put him easily in the top three of the division. And um from from this basically short period of time from his last this his last two victories. Um a lot of people did give him a chance in his last fight. I, I personally did. I, I figured that he would pull it out because um of his character and his will to win. But um I'm very interested in um in the in this fight and I and I honestly I believe he can um pull out another upset <laughs> victory. And I have a great deal of respect for Jorge Lamaris but it's like it's just like one of those things. Like it's at, it's at a point. It's at a point in time where you just can't count Anthony out at all. And um, you know, I wish him the best of luck. But um, you know, just just watching the many things that he's done with his career, it makes me strive to be, you know, to be the best that I can as well. So, you know, looking at guys like Anthony, um, Luke Campbell is another guy who, who suffered one day, who suffered a defeat early in his career. But you know, he's um he's had a great um backing behind him after everything. And it just you know watching those guys from that side of the you know over there on your side of the world just just motivates me as well that I can do great things as well on my end. Yeah, 
Yeah, no, Anthony Crowley, has been through a lot and he's definitely moving forward with a lot of momentum at the moment. Um, the return of Luke Campbell, I think he's fighting on the 16th of July, if I'm not mistaken. So he'll be back. He's fighting quite a decent opponent. I can't remember who it is at the minute. What's your opinion on Terry Flanagan, of course, holding the WBO belt at lightweight? Um, it's crazy. Um, you know, if I would have got past this fight, I would have had um, loved to get a um, chance to fight with um, Terry Flanagan, which I, I had nothing against Terry yet either. Um, Terry's not a bad fighter. I, I could say, you know, his direction, of his, his career isn't probably going as well as um, Anthony's, of course, in terms of exposure. And um, from what I last heard, you know, I believe Mikey Garcia is um, approaching him, but you know, um, can't take too much from him um, because basically he has something that I want. So he, you know, he's a world champion. So I, can, I'll, I'll, I'll never, um, you know, I'll never down him or disrespect him as a, um, a fighter or a man. But um, I feel that um, he can, um, you know, he he could basically. I feel like with his talent, he he's able to at least, you know, fight better opponents than he's going up against next. But you know, who, we, we may never know, man. Things, things may may turn. He may get those fights that he wants. But um. Like I said, I, I would still love I would still love to get a fight, you know, with um, Terry down the road. But right now, I just gotta focus on, you know, what I'm doing and, and re- rebuild my career. Yeah, absolutely. Now, just before I let you go, Jamal, I just wanted to give you a chance to thank anyone or, or you know, give a shout out to anyone. There's a lot of guys over this side of the water, as I say, that that are big fans of yourself. If you've got a message for anyone, just uh, yeah, tell it to us. Oh yeah. Um... I, I, I would love to say thank you to all, all my supporters. I mean, like I said, I got a lot of supporters over in the UK, and I, I was, and I and I truly believe, and I truly, honestly, want to come back to the UK someday to fight. That's why I was, um, I was trying to get the victory as bad as I wanted because, um, really bad on, on my end because I really wanted to travel to the UK, and I would have even um challenged, you know, guys like Terry Flanagan over there, um. If um Anthony if Anthony pulls out a victory over this over over, over uh, if he does pull out a victory over um Linares, I would love to even come over there you know to challenge Anthony as well. But um I just want to say not only thank you to, to my um, my UK fans but um uh, my fans across the globe, and I just want to give um a great shout out to my brother um Jake Gibson who's um also who also lives in the UK he's been a great support and um I like I said I appreciate guys like you as well who gave me a chance to you know to let me be heard and um expand my um character not only just here in the states but around around on that side of the world as well so i'm very grateful and um trust and believe i will be back i will be back, I will be back stronger and better and um you know the, the seed that is not going to bring me down if anything it, it'll just gonna be a stronger and uh, smarter fighter Oh, excellent stuff, Jamal. I'm pleased to hear you say that. Listen, it's always a pleasure speaking with a gentleman such as yourself. Please take good care and we'll be waiting for the return of a smarter, more experienced and more dangerous Jamal Herring. Yes, yes, sir. Yes, sir. And um, like I said, hope we will, you know, you and I will talk again soon. And um, I'm looking forward to hearing from you as well. But um, take care out there and God bless. OK, now it's time for part two on this week's show. It was really nice speaking to Jamel Herring there. And like I say, really, really one of the best guys in the business. Before we roll into the reviewing, because there's really not much to review, before we roll into the reviewing, we're going to just go to that little segment on this show where we talk about the funny names. And we need to read out the results of the, you know, the person from last week. The person from last week with the most crazy, bizarre name was a woman called Petra Superchamp, and she was facing Gretchen Abangyal for the vacant Women's International Boxing Association World Minimum Weight title, and also the Global Boxing Union Female World Minimum Weight title. So I believe that's two world titles. And unfortunately, Petra Superchamp come up short. She was 6-0 and going into this bout. She's now 6-1. and And Gretchen Abangyal moves to 17-8. and It was a unanimous decision over 10 two-minute rounds. So all the best to Gretchen Abangyal. I've got no clue about um, either of the women that took place in that fight, to be honest. I just really love that name, Petra Superchamp. And also... Well, the contestant this week for that part of the show, there's, you know, this week's most bizarre name is a guy. By the time this show goes out, you know, the fight would have taken place. It's actually happening on the Monday, the 4th of July over in Moscow, Russia. There's actually a guy, Ayaz, and I'm really not kidding here. I think I've told you about him before, and it just so happens he's fighting this week. His name is 4-0. He's having a fight 
in the super welterweight division, so the 154 division, over eight rounds against a guy who has a record of three wins, seven losses, and two draws. So this guy's 4-0, undefeated, and his name is Aram. So that's A-R-A-M, Aram. And his last name is Amir Khanian. And I promise you, it is spelled exactly the way our very own Amir Khan spells his name. He is A-M-I-R-K-H-A-N. Y A N. So that's Aram Amir Khanian. And apparently he's quite a decent boxer. So we'll be on the lookout to see how he gets on on the Monday. Like I say, by the time the show goes out, the fight would have already taken place. But we will let you know next week on next week's show if Amir Khanian can stretch his 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 win streak. And maybe you never know, he's in the 154 category. You might see him fight Amir Khan. Could you imagine that? Amir Khan against Amir Khan Yen. It would be a real crazy one. But yeah, anyway, all the best to Amir Khan Yen. Okay, that's it for that little segment there. We're now going to go over to Ayaz with the news. Ayaz, I believe you've got two pieces of news regarding televised fights. They've been um, announced recently. So please t- tell us about those. Yes. Sergei Kovalev will take on Isaac Chalemba this Monday on Boxing Nation. Yes, absolutely. What a fight, Ayaz. What a fight. It's a strange one taking place on a Monday night. So that'll be next Monday. That's the 11th of July. So I'm going to be staying up for that one. Um, sorry, I'm not going to be staying up for that one. It's actually at prime time because it's over in Russia, um, if I'm if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, it's over in Russia. And he takes on Isaac Chalemba. Now, we've seen Isaac Chalemba in there with the likes of Tony Bellew. We know that he's an awkward fighter and we know how good Kovalev is. And I really think he's not really going to put up much of a, you know, a test or whatever. I think he's a good fighter, Chalemba. Maybe a bit better than what he's given credit for. Um, he's coming off of a loss, though. He's coming off of a loss to Alida Alvarez, who's 18 and 0. Uh, that was in November of 2015 so he's been out the ring now for eight months and he's back but you know he will come to fight he always does and he he makes it ugly in there but I really think that Kovalev probably knocks him out and probably knocks him out pretty early you know it's over in Russia Kovalev hasn't fought in Russia he's been fighting over in you know the USA and and Canada and that he hasn't actually fought in Russia I believe since 2011 so it's going to be like five years and it's, it's a homecoming for him. So I think he's going to put on a show for those Russian fans that will come out to see him. And I bet it's a sold out arena, just like he deserves. Seriously, one of the most, um, in my opinion, exciting fighters to watch in world boxing right now. OK, so it's brilliant that Box Nation have picked that up. And we'll be speaking to Barry Jones very, very shortly. And he'll be telling us about that fight and a few other things. He's going to go right into his career when we speak to him, which I'm looking forward to in a couple of moments. Ayaz, what was the other piece of news? Sky will be televising the heavyweight clash between Deontay Wilder and Chris Ariola in Birmingham, Alabama on July, 20, on July 16th. July 16th, yes. Yeah, so only five days later. So it's good to see that five days between the two cards taking place on, on TV this week, of course, for Box Nation. It's the Monday. And for Sky viewers, it is the Saturday. So both cards are going to be really good. I'm looking forward to the Areola and Deontay Wilder fight. As I say, we're going to give that a full breakdown next week. But it's good that Sky have picked that up. It's quite late notice. I was hoping that we'd get to see that, but I didn't think anyone would pick it up because it's not, you know, it's not a great fight. But like I say, we'll, we're going to go into that next week. But um, good piece of news there, and it's it's good for boxing fans that you know that subscribe to these channels. And there's going to be a lot to watch next week at home, so I'm excited for that. Okay, Ayas, is that it for the news? Yes, that's it for the news. Okay, now it's time for the previewing. And as I said, there really isn't anything to preview. It's literally just the one fight between Kovalev and Chilemba. I mean, that's really it. There's not much else on that card it's it's like as i say it's a russian card a lot of russians fighting on it i think every fighter is russian so it's one of those cards it's not brilliant it's just got that that good fight at the top of the bill so sergey kovalev 29 and 0 with the one draw he puts his wba super world light heavyweight title his ibf world light heavyweight title and his wbo world light heavyweight title on the line over 12 rounds in the light heavyweight division if you didn't guess against isaac chalemba 24 
wins, three losses and two draws. I as I kind of gave my opinion on this fight when you told us that it was going to be showed on Box Nation a moment ago in the news segment. What's your opinions on this fight, I as? Oh, this is a very good fight. Well, I reckon uh, it's a very it's a very easy win for Kovalev, and I reckon Kovalev will knock him out. Yeah, I mean, how early would you say it? I know that I've spoke to Barry Jones recently, and I know that he was saying to me that he thinks that he's going to be probably in like around round six. I actually think a lot earlier. I I think maybe about around around about round three. I don't know what you're thinking, Ayaz, because let's do a prediction on this, Ayaz, because I know that you're winning one nil with the Sean Porter thing. I'm gonna say, I'm gonna say Kovalev round three. I'm going round three, same as you. Ah, uh, we got to go. You got to, uh, listen, you got to move for me. I moved for you the other time. You got to go round four or round two. Okay, round, I'll go round five. You go round five. All right, you go round five and I'll go round three. And if it's round four, then we're stuffed. We only get a point each. But hopefully I managed to get one one with you on that leaderboard. I has no cheating on there, by the way. <laughs> no worries, no cheating. <laughs> okay well that's it it's time to wrap up part two as i said there really hasn't been that much talking it was nice to speak to jamel herring earlier we're now going to welcome a good friend of mine actually barry jones and of course there's a lot a lot of space to fill it's been a really short show and we're going to get him on and he's going to do a lot a lot of talking which is exactly what this show needs otherwise no one wants to listen for 25 minutes then just to tune out they need a big hour or so and i think barry jones is going to deliver just that Okay, now it's time for guest number two on this week's show. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the former WBO super featherweight champion of the world, Mr. Barry Jones. Barry, welcome to the show. Hey, how you doing, mate? You good? Very good, man. Yourself? Yeah, good, Joe. Over the moon, mate. Happy to be on. Happy to be on. Excellent, excellent. All right, the first thing I wanted to ask you, Barry, was, you know, for the people that don't know, just tell us how your journey all began. You know, I I believe that you took up boxing at the age of 10. Walk us through the journey, please. Yeah, I took up boxing at the age of 10. No, I I, I, I always enjoyed boxing. You know, everyone, every every council, if they could, in in Britain probably enjoyed watching boxing. But I didn't have no aspirations of being a boxer. I went because I had an older brother. He was a pretty good boxer. He went, so I followed him, like a lot of younger brothers do. And I wasn't great at it to start off with. And what what really attracted me to the sport was win or lose, you get a trophy. To be honest, you know, when you're a kid, when you're a kid, you know, you you do a whole season of football, rugby, whatever, any other sport, and you and you get a little tiny little plaque, and in boxing, you you would get a trophy, which was about four inches at the time. I think they're even bigger nowadays. And then I lost my first fight, and I thought I'll have some of that. And then I went on and had a big run of. I had a, about ten wins after that, maybe, and yeah, so that was it. And once, when the once winning is addictive in any in anything in life, it's addictive, and and that's what stuck me to it. And also, I was a hyperactive kid with um, who loved to train. I wasn't I wasn't massively gifted at sports, but I was pretty good at every sport, you know that sort of thing. So I was playing every sport you could think of, and actually, my favourite sport uh, next to boxing is basketball, which is ironic because I'm, I'm a midget. I know. <laughs> but I, I actually, I, yeah, and I know this. I know, I know. I, I, I got a mirror. I can see how small I am. And so, yeah, for basketball was my basketball was my sport that I used to play all the time. And it was um, only when I started getting really good at boxing, I mean, started winning Welsh titles and stuff, that that my trainer wrongly, to be honest, said you have to pick. You can't. You have to pick. Now you know you're boxing on. It's boxing or, or nothing. You know, it's, you have to pick boxing, or you do, or you go go bother boxing and, and just do other sports. You can't play any other sports apart from boxing because I was good, which was a terrible thing to say to like a 14-year-old kid. But that was it. I stopped doing sports at 14 then. I did all I did was boxing. So I luckily, my PE teacher in school was, was, was quite understanding. So I would play for the school sides, but when there was too much going on, then I was, when I had like a fight coming up, he would let me have my own little time and do my own training in, um, in games time or PE time, whatever it would be. So yeah, I missed out on some sports, but I, um, I picked the right sport for me. I wasn't going to be a professional basketball player or, or, or a football player and certainly not a rugby player. So basketball's not big in the UK, but no, it, it's a fantastic sport and, and, and our sport could learn a lot from it as well. Put it this way, you, know, you get you get a you get a giant well actually that's it's wrong now. Before you would get a giant six foot six, six foot eight and they would be robotic. It, it's Tyson Fury and Dante Wilder that have broke the mold a little bit with that. But you know, that's what basketball players they're six foot nine Seven foot, and they and they're so athletic. They can do somersaults. It's, it's amazing what they can do. And 
Right. Anyway, this is a boxing podcast, I presume, not a basketball podcast. <laughs> anyway, yeah, yeah. I just want to so ask I, you, I, just I before you get into that, I, I do want to ask you. You said, got... you said that you tried a lot of sports. Yeah. Did you ever give netball a try? No, I never gave netball a try. I, I just wanted to clear that one up. Only... <laughs> it's a female only sport. It, it, you know, I tried a few. I tried a few water sports, and I wasn't very good at them either. <laughs> a little bit. That's a play on words there. I like to write that. I was good, wasn't I? I'm not being rude, but I'm almost being rude. <laughs> yeah, okay, but it, go it, on. I picked boxing, and, and then I, I started to win. I started to win titles, and I never lost the Welsh title as an amateur. I, I lost the British title as a schoolboy. I never actually lost it. I, got, I, um, I failed the medical, actually, the day of the British schoolboy finals. I was boxing a kid called Scott Dan, who was who been to every schoolboy final and only lost to Nazim Hamid one year. So he probably he probably would have beat me anyway. Who knows? But yeah, I failed the medical. Who would know the news to come that would come that I would fail the medical. Well, again, just ruined my career, as, as fate would have it. But, yeah, that was it. So I, I carried on, and I was quite successful as an amateur. I wasn't the best, but I was pretty good. And, and I beat some good kids, and I won a, a, some good titles, and I won a silver medal in European juniors, which now is nothing. But back then, it was a pretty big deal, you know, back in the, in, in 1992. And, and then I, um, I turned pro, wrongly, to be honest. I should have waited for the Commonwealth Games in 94, but I, I didn't know I had... Well, where I'm from, you want everything now, and it was. I had some people around me who were telling me I was the best thing they've ever seen, and I turned pro at 18, which was too young, and and then and that was it. Then I um, embarked on a professional career and won a few fights and lost one. I'm not going to say that's pretty much what it was. It was no, I, 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 it's only my career because the latter part of my career, if I'm not going too far ahead for you, just stop me whenever you need to stop me. But no, go was, on. the latter part of my career was pretty much seems pretty much manufactured. You know, a kid who gets a world title fight don't really deserve it. That that's what that was my career. Before I before I go on, I love boxing more than I love my career. So I'm honest about my career, my my, my titles and, and what I've done and, and, and what and what a lot of people have done. I don't I don't um, belittle people's achievements, but I love the sport more than I love myself. So more than I love my career, I should say. So you know, me being a world champion, I'm proud of it, and I and I got that I got that belt, and it's mine forever, and that, and that might could never be taken away from me until I lose my marbles. But the fact is, I was never good enough to be a world champion. If world champion was what it should be, what it used to be, and it's, and it's worse now. No, I'm a genuine world champion now compared to the titles I go nowadays. But even it, it's ridiculous. It, it, it's ridiculous. There's too many kids walking around saying they're world champions, and I'm one of them. Who shouldn't be? They said I was good enough to be a European champion, possibly, and and I was definitely good enough to be a British champion. I'm I'm, pretty, I'm sure of that. And I should that should that used to mean that used to mean as much. That used to mean just as much. No, I, I, you know, you've got only world champions you got nowadays, and nobody knows who they are. I literally, I was a world champion, and even my father can remember my name. You know what I mean? Like my grandfather, my grandfather calls me Joe. He's only called me Barry. You know, you know, hey. You know, you know, <laughs> No, you know it's like it's ridiculous. You know, it, 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 a bit when title should be, you should be the. What, no, I'm saying you should be the very best because sometimes people get lucky breaks. But you should be in the top three, four, or five at least in the world, not the top three, four, or five in Britain, which is what happens and what's happening more now. And, and we got 13 world champions or 12, and 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 it's phenomenal. And you know, it's not. Listen, we're doing better than the other country. You know, the. It's 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 wrong. It's not it's not how the sport should be. So I I want to so the the last part of my career was seen fairly manufactured, but actually the earlier part of my career was quite tough. I had a lot of I had a lot of hard learning fights. Like the first kid I boxed was undefeated in three, and then I boxed a journeyman Miguel Matthews. But he was the sort of journeyman who, at the time, I just guessing his record was something like one fifteen lost thirty. So. You know, he won a few. You know, he was he would be if you were if you run into the mark, he would beat you, not just close shop. And then I boxed a kick on Michael Deveni, who went to the Olympics four years before, and went on to win a British title like eighteen months after I beat him. Then I boxed a kid who only lost one fight, and I and that was my only stoppage, which somehow box could take taken off me, but I don't care about that. I stopped him in one round with a cut, but a cut, you know, stoppage is a stoppage. And then I boxed a kid called Neil Swain, who was undefeated. You no know, two rounds, and he went on to win the Commonwealth title after I beat him, and and and, and that's where it went on. Then I, I boxed another undefeated kid, and to, to box um, Justin Murphy at the, at the day's notice. It was he was like ten, eleven, and zero. You no, know, to get a fight, it, it was it was a pretty um, st- 
steep learning curve then, and then obviously I couldn't get fights because I, I was obviously hard to beat, but I did, I, but I wasn't exciting to watch, and I wasn't a big, I was a good ticket teller back home in Cardiff, but I wasn't, you know, I had no big promoter, I was a small time manager, I wasn't with Frank Warren at the time, but I was with Billy Ed, the ex, the ex professional um, heavyweight, and, and Pat Thomas, who was a double British champion, was my trainer, and so we had no funding, you know, no money, and. and and then you know you have to go to people's backyards. I have to go to I boxed on the old Trafford Bill and Ben and Newbank, you know Trafford '93. Boxed the kid who was undefeated from Manchester. I went up there to get beat. That's where that was. I took that was a week. That was a week's notice, which you know most boxers nowadays wouldn't take that. But a week's notice back when I was fighting was for a six rounder was plenty of notice. You know, my world title fight was three weeks notice, and all I kept thinking was, what am I going to do with the other week? I'll have a week off, then I start training. It was three weeks notice was was a luxury for me. I, um, but before that point, I never had more than three weeks notice for a fight. It was, I never never had training camps or all these people thought were training camps and and how you prepare properly for a fight and making weights and stuff. And I never did any of that. I had the most unorthodox, almost backwards, you know, Stone Age training um, mentality you'd ever heard of. You know, I never I, for the first three years of my professional career. I never trained in a boxing gym. That's a true story. I now and again I go to Swansea and spar with a couple of kids in their gym. That would be it. I would train in creches, squash courts, the back of the leisure centre sometimes when we couldn't get a room, and that's how I trained. So the, the only time I get in an, actual, in an actual ring most of the time was on fight night, and so it held me back, but it sort of didn't. It made me, it steeled me mentally because nothing phased me. You know, I wasn't worried about. The big, the, the guy, no, some twenty-eight-year-old guy when I was eighteen, like spitting at me and telling me he's gonna kill me, and or you know going to Manchester and boxing our kids away from home, or taking a fight at day at, at a day's notice and uh, against an undefeated kid, and none of, none of these things bother me. It was just like, oh, I'll do it. I don't give a shit. And it is what it is, you know. I wasn't a tough, I wasn't a tough kid on on the surface. I couldn't punch to save my life, and I was a, I was a move and a runner. But I think inside I was quite quite tough, you know, because obviously where you grew up as well, I didn't grow up in the nicest of areas, so you have to be a little bit, if you weren't if you weren't physically big, you have to be a little bit mentally tough and, and smart enough to sort of stay out of the way, so I was, a, I was a quiet kid who wouldn't take any shit, I guess, you know, I suppose, in many ways, and that's why, that's why I took my career, I, I, I was a quiet kid, and I boxed like a quiet kid, I boxed on the move, didn't try and hurt anyone, didn't go for the kill, but you know, when people tried to play on me, I would, I would show enough I guess balls to, to fire back to keep them away, and that was um, that was my concern. Like that was my career in, in a nutshell. I'm a jammy little bastard. The one I will totally didn't deserve, <laughs> and that's pretty, that's pretty much it. Yeah. Barry, why? I've heard you talk a lot of times about your career, and I've never seen someone like bash themselves. Not in that way. I know the way you'll be thinking. Never seen anyone no, sort no, no, of no, downplay no. themselves so much. No, I, I, I know, I know. It's, I'm, I, it's, it's, it's obviously a, it's, it's been truthful. It's a defense mechanism because I don't want people to criticize me, and and I guess that's it. But also, like I said, I love my sport, and I honestly think, and in the world, it, it can be said, but definitely in Britain, since the 90s, you can take at least 80% of our world champions and kick them and, and just relegate them to European level. And some of them don't do British level. And I might be, I'm, so I could be one of the worst kids who ever won a world title for a bit. I'm not saying I am or I'm not, but I'm, just, I'm nowhere near the top, obviously. And I, know, I know Joe Kazaghi and Mari, that's for sure. But, but listen, I was a good boxer. And I, was like, I, I was good, I had lots of skills. And to be honest, if I was trained the right way, if I had proper training and, proper, and, and was brought in properly and turned pro at the right time, I would have been a better fighter. If you and I say this, if you see every chain I had, thought I could punch, and and if you see me go to the gym now, you wouldn't believe that I couldn't punch. I was never a puncher, but I can punch my weight. But I was always like the guy who had me my first gym pro. He had me do this stupid style, and it ruined and it messed me up. And then I stopped. I think I think twelve of my last sixteen fights as, a, as an amateur, mainly body shots. To be fair, that's not that's not technique. But yeah, so I, I sort of put myself down because I. I thought, you know, it, 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 it should mean more. World titles should mean, it's like I love what I've done. I'm proud of myself in many ways. And I'm in the record books and, and, I, and I'm happy with that. But, and you get opportunities and you deserve Like Steve Robinson didn't deserve to be a world champion from Cardiff. I love him. Didn't deserve it. But then once he got it, he proved he was worthy by beating some fighters who, who were on paper were 10 times better than him. So 
he, he, he proved his worth in the end, and I never had the opportunity to do that. And maybe if I did have the opportunity to do that, like I did produce the goods, then I wouldn't be doing the same what I'm saying now. But the fact is, you know, I jumped the queue for other people. I jumped the queue of people who, who, who worked their way up the rankings, and, and, and it happens now. Even Lomachenko, he, he jumped the queue. He's a, listen, he's a fantastic fighter, and he would beat, he would beat most people on his, on his debut. But the fact is, he jumped the queue of people who, who worked their way up the rankings, and I don't think it's fair, and I certainly don't think it's, it's right that, that British or European level or domestic level in any country, can walk around saying you're world champion when it should be the the, the best of the best. No, if no, if I was a beat, I beat a good kid like called Afi De who he was European champion. I beat him just before I got the world title fight. So I I, beat, I was beating good, I was beating good people. I'm not I'm not saying I wasn't good, but I know I like Wales now, and, and, and I like people who like Greece when they win the European Championships in football, or people who win tournaments. They win, they beat people, and they get the opportunity, but they qualify. But in boxing, you don't have a qualifying. You don't have a qualifying form. You don't have a qualifying criteria. You just go with the right guy. You know, before those intercontinental title fights were meant to be sort of qualifying fights to get the opportunity to get near a, British, a, a world title level. Now they, you have what you have. You have a WBC title, international title, or a IBF intercontinental title, and you, and you get a world title fight straight away off the back of it. And and I don't think it's, it doesn't do our sport any good. That's why I say it. That's why I have to put myself down before I can criticise other people because I'm well aware that I, can, I can't criticise a guy who doesn't, doesn't deserve a title shot when I'm that. I, I, I won a world title off the, the same way. I jumped the queue because I think Floyd Havard, I, I think, who from Swansea was a good fighter, I think he got, he got off of my world title fight originally because it was his weight. Super featherweight, it wasn't my weight. And he got off of the world title fight and he turned it down because he wasn't enough notice, which he was probably right because he, he wouldn't have had to have lost a lot of weight. But where I was a naturally a featherweight, really, really, I was a super bantamweight, really. So super featherweight for me, I'd never ever, I went, I went to every weigh in eating a Mars bar. I never struggled to make the weight. So it was ridiculous. Which, never, which, which was fine, but then come fight night, then the following night, you know, as I finally got to gain Safarino Freitas, it was a, you know, you see the size and then when they fill out it, it, it then you're worried. But yeah, so that, that's why I put myself that's why I put, sort of put myself down because I, I I love boxing, it's been my life, it's saved it haven't saved my life from I wasn't I wasn't gonna be in prison or stuff like that. I wasn't one of those kids, but I wouldn't my life wouldn't amount to anything but you know, medium. My whole life would have been medium. That's what it would have been. I would have a job, kids, moved on and that's and that's nothing wrong with that, but I wouldn't have no excitement in my life from boxing of of taking me places and showing me things I would never have seen before. And, and so I love it for that. It's been my life. My, boxing's my first love. I'm like, all oh, first loves, you know, you, you want to protect it and, and it breaks your heart and all the rest of it, but you always want to go back to it. And that's what it is to me. I, I, I can understand why why I wouldn't want to, like, say, you know, let's clean the sport up and let, let, let's, let's get it right. And there's just too, there's too many kids. There's kids who win the world titles now and they, and, they box in, and they haven't even boxed world level. There's world champions who who are having multiple defenses and they're having box world level. And that, and how, how can you how can you call? It's not the kids' fault, maybe because you know maybe it is, maybe I don't know. But you know how, how can you have how can you pat him on the back and say, "Oh, you're a world champion," when you you thinking, "Yeah, but you're not really." And that's what I was. You know, I was a world champion. You really, if you really were honest, you go, "Yeah, you done well. Congratulations." That's I think, you know, was you the best in the world? Was you the top four in the world at the time? And I'd have to say no. I wasn't. <laughs> you know, I don't know what I'm gonna say. Well, listen, you know, you say, all you can do, is, all, you, all I can do is be honest. And and and, and you know, and if it's, if it's putting myself down, I don't, I don't want to sleep myself. I I'm not saying I wouldn't have beat some good people. My first defense was Julian Lawsey, which was world class, and I'm sure I would have beat him because styles make fights. And I think my style was perfect to to beat him. I mean, he could have stopped me maybe, but I think I was tougher than what people give me credit for. And I think I could have beat him then. Then I'm world class, then I proved I'm world class then. Then my first defence, you know, rubber stamps my, my world title credentials. Then did not, then I then I wouldn't be ever putting myself down. If I would have got if I were, if it wouldn't have been for the brain scan, I would have got that defence. And if he would have beat me, then I would have gone, Well, you know, I'd won a world title, but I wasn't ready. You know, that's what it, it would have said that's what I would have said, you know. And, you know, if I was twenty three with eighteen fights, you know, or seventeen fights before I got to the world title, so you know, it wasn't it was oh, it was quite early for me, you know, in age and, and Fights was so, you know, I'd, and, and that's what that, and that's what it would have been. But I never got that opportunity to prove I was world class because I didn't know I was. I didn't know whether I was world class or not. That's the thing. I, 
we're talking about like Liam Smith boxing Canelo now September the 17th now you can't give Liam Smith a, a hell of a chance you, know, you can't give Liam Smith a chance to win this fight because you just go by what's, what's been proven Canelo though he's had a lot of his fights have been you know, you know picked well you know he's been strategically placed in front of him his opponent he's beat world class opposition and Liam hasn't so you have to go with what you know which is Canelo is, is going to beat him but Liam might prove that he belongs there. You know, in defeats maybe, or, or in victory, I don't know. But, you know, until he does it, you can't say that he can beat Canelo. You can't. I, I can't say you can say it. And, you know, I don't want to upset the kid, but you have to be honest with yourself. And, and that's what I see. And, and that's the same in my career. Until I, until I beat the world-class fighter, how could you possibly say I was a, world, I was a worthy world champion? You couldn't. And that's, and that's how it is, and that's how it should be for everyone else. Okay, well, listen. At the end of the day, I'm. Uh, <laughs> I, I've almost. Uh, I, 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 I'm. I'm proud. I'm proud of you for, for winning that belt. At least you got me on your side, anyway. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, no, no. Listen, no one's, no one's like, no one's like me. I've no one has a go at me. You know, because I'm not a braggart. No, I don't. I don't walk around. With, no, except for that. I don't Prince Patel that, that bullied me one night. But you know, past <laughs> that, no one, but no one has a go at me. And you know, I was a good fighter. You know, I, I was. You know, Better than most people, I, I, I believe that. But you know, it's, it's it, you've got to be honest. You know, I'm honest with myself. I was happy with what I did. I, I, I hit the jackpot, didn't I? Not financially, but I hit the jackpot. I achieved my lifetime ambition. So how can I be upset about that? Absolutely. My life, ever since I, ever since I put a pair of gloves on, I want to be a world champion. Every boxer does. And you, and you, I, I was, I was, I was WBC welterweight champion of the world when I was ten years of age in my mind because Sugar Ray Leonard was my idol. So I wanted to win what he won. You know, I, I want to be welterweight, WBC welterweight champion of the world. That's what I wanted to be. Very Leonard. Like that. I want to be. I want to be that. I want to be the white ginger, freckly, <laughs> hairy chested Sugar Ray Leonard. That was my ambition. Now I wanted to just talk because a lot of people know, a lot of people don't know. Obviously, the, the WBO stripped you, and and you you had your license taken away for a period. Just in a nutshell, yeah. can you explain how that went? Because obviously. You was out of the ring for a while, then you came back in and got another shot, which you said was against Freitas, and you come up short that night. But what was the for oh. the people that don't know what happened? Uh, you know what happened for, for your license yeah. to be taken away, Barry? Well, I, I did, I, I've never failed a brain scan, but I have, I have changed my scan. And at the time, at the time, when you, in British boxing, you used to have to have a CT scan when you turn, when you turned professional, and that was it. And then. But then the, after Michael Watson, they brought in MRI scans, which are like 10 times more detailed or whatever. They're more, you, know, you can see more. So in 97 was the first time every British boxer had to have an uh, MRI scan to go with your HIV tests and your, and, your, and your eye tests and all your medicals. And that was the first time. So in 1998, I won my, I won my World Title December 97. 98 was the first year they had something to compare it with. So obviously my scan had moved. It's... Um, Anyone who got kids will know this. When in the centre of your skull, at the front, there's a soft spot when the babies, and it joins, and it, it's two membranes, and, it join, and they join together. But if they don't, if it, some, in, one in ten, they believe, don't actually join together, and that's called the cave and septum pellucidi. So I, I had the cave and septum pellucidi, which it could have been done from trauma, or it could have been born that way. But then from the scan from '97, so it, it was on the scan in '97, but the scan from '97 to '98. It moved by 0.2 of a millimeter, and they didn't know what it was, so they withheld my license, which is obviously initially is the perfect thing to do. The problem is, though, I went to see a brain surgeon, and and he said to me, like one of the top ones in the country, and it cost me a few quid to be fair, and he said to me, I can see what they're talking about, but in my professional opinion, you're under no more danger than any other boxer in the country. So I went to the boxing ball with that information, and then their doctor, which was a doctor Whiteson, I think his name was at the time. Who's just a GP, which is a, you know, compared to, he's not a brain surgeon, he's a jack of all trades in the medical industry. And he said, no. But I said, I got a medical expert here, one of the top, one, top three or four in, the, in his field in the country, saying, I'm, well, he, I'm in a normal thing than any other boxer. It was like the appendix of the brain. They wasn't quite sure what it, what, what it did. And then they tried, I, I don't go into the massive details, but that, but that was it. They stopped us on boxing. I obviously then appealed because, I, no, listen, I'm, I'm an. I'm a, not intelligent, but I'm a safe enough guy the way I box. I never fought in my face. You know, I'm, no, I'm no hero. So if there was something wrong with me, if I was a chance I was going to be dead or something worse, or, you know, or 
you know, injured and, you know, you know for the rest of disabled, I, I wouldn't fight. I'm not a fucking idiot. But they, it wasn't that. You know, at best, they were telling me, I was saying, well, what's the worst case scenario? They said, you could suffer with increased humility in your later life. So I went, but that's a moral decision, not a medical decision. That's a moral decision because every boxer who takes punches risks that. You risk that. You know the risk. You, you, know, you see, you, you see, old time boxers now you know, who are not in the best of health, or they slur their words, or you know, or a little bit, you know, the senility increases more in that they're not in best of shape as someone who hasn't boxed for instance. That's like more than not. That's what happens. That's because they're taking punches all their life. You sort, you, you, you take that risk to provide your family of a better quality of a younger life, and and they said no, and they wouldn't have it. And so I said, I went back with a barrister, and. Within half an hour, I got my license back. But that took about 18 months. I was out for a long time. And then, obviously, the WBO reinstated me as number one contender for my old title. But those, those sort of like, that sort of 12 months that I was out, out of boxing, my world, the, I, the, the Super Federated Division was quite weak in the world. It wasn't mega weak, but there was no stars. But that, that 12 months, 18 months out, it went from no stars to the WBA champion was Yoel Casamayor. Olympic champion, fabulous fighter. The IBF champion was Diego Corrales, a well, okay, phenomenal fighter. The WO champion was Freight, actually Freight, this was pound for pound biggest punch in the world at that time. And the WBC champion was, was a young Floyd Mayweather. So am I gonna, who am I going to beat other than them? It was literally, who's going to beat me up the, who's gonna beat me up the least? That's what it was, picking, if I would have a choice. If I would have a choice who to fight, I would have picked Freitas because I thought he could be outboxed. No, he's not, it isn't. If he hits you, he hurts you. But I'm not going to outbox Casimir. He's going to outbox me and beat me up. Corrales, I can't outbox a six foot super featherweight. He's going to knock me out. And, and Mayweather would would absolutely, you know, just make me cry, wouldn't he? I'd be in the middle of the ring and cry my eyes out. You know, he, so, so Freitas, Freitas was no. I, I, had no, I didn't have a choice. But if I had a choice, I would have picked Freitas. And but you know, I, I knew he was powerful. But I said I said before the fight because I was always honest. People said, well, what are you worried about his power? I went, well, of course I am. I'm not stupid. I, I said, but the, the, I don't think you can get on with the fight. I said, well, you know, the first big punch he hits me with, if I'm still on my feet, he won't beat me. That's it. He's not going to outbox me, because that's what I do. So if the first big punch he hits me with, if I'm on my feet, he can't beat me. And the first big punch he hit me with, he put me down with. <laughs> so... I had this spot on. You know, I had this spot on. I was, I was already a good pundit when I was boxing. I could, I could, I could literally commentate on my own fucking career. <laughs> <laughs> now, Barry, I wanted to ask no, you because I don't know. Go on. No, go on. Go on I wanted to ask you this because I don't know too much about the stats and stuff like that. But has anyone else ever won a world title and retired without picking up like a stoppage win on paper? I know that you got that one took away from you. Yeah, I did took away. I don't know why, because like if they're taking away cuts, well, some a uh, lot of Ricky Hatton fights with, well, uh, these one fights with cuts. People want fights with cuts and let it go on. I don't understand that. Why would you take that away from me? I think I probably got the worst. I don't know. I don't think so. I think it's, it might be the worst, actually. To be fair, which is which is this is I'm on my own now. I'm in my own little group. Yeah, group. I think yeah, I was it's, so good. It's quite I impressive. So, I was so good. I was so good slash bad. Well, they, well, it did. This is true. It proved I couldn't punch. Yeah, I couldn't punch. I could punch my weight, but I was always moving away. You know, and I had no confidence. So you see a few people. I've I've dropped a few people throughout my career. Say this was one of them. But I've dropped a few other people. Right? And who, obviously on Sky at the time, they just said, um, cause they, you know, they didn't really know. I they didn't even know much about me. I've been on Sky a few times before. They didn't know much about me. They just said, oh, this, say this was the first person I've ever dropped. But it wasn't. I dropped a few kids, and and but then I would what I would do then because the Again, because of my training from my early early stage of my career, I never had no tr- I never had no learning fights. They were all competitive fights, and the way the guy trained me, you know, the way he had me wanting me dancing around like Muhammad Ali, and it didn't work for me. Cause I didn't have the, the the skill for to do that, and I didn't certainly have the physical attributes to do that. I was different. I used to be as an amateur. I was always a mover, but I was like an aggressive counter puncher. So I was always be I would be in and out, in and out. But I'd always be on you because my engine was tremendous as an amateur. I mean, I was really brilliant. I was so fit. So I'd be on you, away, on you, in, half in, half step in, half step out, and throwing fast punches. And I'd stop. And I'd let, unload a few heavy shots, and I'd move again. But you know, I was always about self-preservation. That's the way I was. And most of us pretty boys are. And then I know that's <laughs> a joke, by the way. I know I'm not pretty. But you know, but. 
and I guess, and then obviously, you know, this, the, the being trained the way that I wasn't comfortable, I lost confidence in holding my feet. So I just, you just stick to what you know. What, what you know, and that, well, what, what was winning me fights was my, my, my footwork, was my movement. So I just stuck with that. And then obviously, you don't try and, even the world title fight, I caught it with the right hand, I could see him hurt. And I wouldn't go in for the kill. A world title fight now, the biggest fight of your life, and I wouldn't go in for the kill. And I regret that. I would have stopped that kid because he wasn't that. He wasn't great, to be honest. He could punch. He had the power. I could feel the power. But I could take a good shot. I've never been on the floor in my life until Freitas. Which takes me to a very good bit of commentary from Glenn McCrory on Sky when when I got put down about... I went down six times against Freitas in eight rounds, which is a feat in itself, actually. Which is an absolute slaughter, really. I, 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 you've, got to feel, you've got to question the referee. And also, you've got to question... My father, my father in the corner. Why didn't he throw the <laughs> earlier? You know what I mean? We did have a row the, the day before, and I wonder whether you know, he should kiss my old man. No, no. So then, I think I went down about I went down about four times, and then and Ian Dark said, and Barry Jones never on the floor in his life, and then Glenn McCauley said, but he's making up for it tonight, and I thought it was the funniest bit of commentary I've ever heard in my life. <laughs> the one guy said, and Barry Jones never been on the floor in his life. And then, and then McCauley said, but he's making up for it tonight. I said, Thanks, Glenn. And, but he's too a lot. So never been on the floor in my life. So I knew I could take a punch. And, but you know what? That fight, this fight, was, you know, I, t- I took an absolute hiding. But that's actually the proudest moment in my career. That is. Because, forget about, I had no excuses why I lost that fight. You know, I never sparred before the fight because of the brain scan stuff I was paranoid never sparred I'd had one fight I hadn't boxed for 18 I'd one fight in, in almost two years and that was six months prior that was the sixth rounder against a mate of mine called Chris Williams so I never really had no preparation for that fight plus Freight has never made the weight anyone who was there will tell you Ian Dark and, and they all he never made the weight I, I don't know how he got away with it but he never made the weight but I didn't make that excuse on the night after the got beat because I knew in my heart he was beating me anyway. He was too good to me, so I didn't. So it was, it was nice. I could put, I could lay that to feed the rest because he, when you got people saying he's better than you, you know it, and you accept it. You no, know, if there's a guy you think you should beat, and he beats you, and then you're disappointed. So I wasn't too much. But it was the proudest moment of my life because I never been on the floor in my life. I took an eye in, but I took it. Do you know what I mean? I, it's, it's hard. I was prouder than that. Which in winning world title was my biggest achievement, but that. I went down six times, but you know what? I got up six times. And, and, I, and I, that sort of, it, that, that's done something to me, actually. That's, that proved to myself that I, you know, however good or bad I am at boxing, I'm not a shithouse. I may box like a shithouse. I may move, you know, I'm on my feet, dancing, throwing light punches and moving away and not trying not to take any punches. But I proved in that fight that I, I'm not a shithouse. The, the first left hook he hit me with in the first round, the, first, the second time he dropped me, it popped my rib up, my cartilage. It was in so much pain. And I went, and I went out rounds like that, in pain, constantly pain. I didn't know what, with the adrenaline, see, it wasn't like a, as bad as it would be. Cause I, so I was hurt, I was getting dropped. It was pain, I was going to the floor. Cause most of these shots, for body shots, I was dropping me. I, but I couldn't understand, because I wasn't windy, I couldn't understand what it was. Until obviously, no, no, after, then I was told that, you know, I'd done some really bad damage, and it, was, it, could, have been, it could have been a lot worse, like, you know, for me. And but um, yeah, it's part of myself. I took my, I took, I took an eye and I took it, and I got up and I tried to fight back, uh, and I just wasn't good enough. You know what? What, what are you going to do? It's too big for me. Too big. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's, it's good. To... You, came up, you come up, you come up the eighth You went to such close to me, and I went. What are you doing? It's not the last round. And he went. It is for you. Wow, I didn't know that. I made that up. I oh, made you that made that up, <laughs> Barry. <laughs> <laughs> No, um, it's good to hear you sort of finish off, you know, that little segment there with a bit of positivity. Yeah. Because oh, yeah, no, yeah, no, no. you you bash yourself all the time, man. You're too harsh on yourself, in my yeah. opinion, Barry. I told him what I did. No, I taught my amateur career. My, I, was, I was loved my amateur career, and I, you know, and I, and I, and I love boxing. I was, you know, but that fight, I loved that. I loved that fight in many ways. You know, I wish I, I could have done things differently, and you know, maybe this and maybe that. But you know, we all, everyone has that. Nothing's perfect, but. Yeah, like, you know, I, I stood up when I had to, or when I could. <laughs> but, you know, I, I, I took an eye against a guy who was too big for me, by the way, because I was never a super featherweight. Too big, too skillful, faster than me. He had everything I had, plus everything I didn't have. Well, what the, you know, yeah. it's, like, it's like 
it's like he turns up with a gun, I turns up with a pea shooter. You know, that's what it was like. <laughs> and but he loved he loved me for that. And every time I've seen him since, I've seen him like three times since. He loves me. Played this because that was his first test. I know I dropped him. It didn't really hurt him. It was just a clean shot. But he was he was so tight on the weight that he he went so he went so out so out to batter me for the first three rounds. I was down four times in three rounds. It's a good fight, really, because there's five knockdowns in the first three rounds. <laughs> you know, like it was, it could, in, that, in that respect, I put him down in 20 seconds. You know, it's, you, listen, you know you're going to get beat. When you drop somebody, but you still lose that round by two points. How can, <laughs> how can that happen? <laughs> I, mean, I dropped him. I never dropped him. And then I still lose that round by two points. You, you know things are against you, but no, it was his biggest test because it was a hard fight for him because I wouldn't go. I, would, I just I was like an irritating little like, like disease where it just wouldn't go away. He's like... He must be, and he was blown up his ass. He was in the last round, and so in the seventh, in the seventh round before he stopped me in, in the eighth, he was spent. Because he tried so hard, he was he was tight on the weight. Remember, he's, he's a Brazilian who's too big for the weight anyway, really. And he had to, he had to fight. He's, in, he's over in the UK then in January with it snowing for God's sake. He was freezing, you know, and, and he and he's trying to lose weight and he's struggling for weight and all the rest of it. And, and he was because the day before the fight, he was like a dead man walking to go to the scales. I said, God, he looked ill. Mm. This is before they would check weight and all that. He was ill. But he couldn't fight night. He looked like he'd been pumped up with a balloon, like with a, with a pump. He was massive. He took his top off when he got into the ring. And me and my father started laughing from nerves. <laughs> he looked like a welterweight. I just, I just went, I went, <laughs> look at the size. I was going, look at the size of him, Dad. Look at that. I can't fight that. <laughs> I didn't hear the corner saying it. I was going, I can't fight that. Look at the size of him. <laughs> Obviously, we're joking, but I, I, I was never, it was never, I, was in, I took boxing serious, but I could never, I didn't have to get in that. I won the women's fight, I had to get in that zone because I wasn't aggressive. I wasn't going up to bash everyone up. I didn't have to be. I had to be relaxed, me, because for my, for my box, I had to be relaxed, and, and being relaxed was joking wrong. That's what made me relax. So, so in, the, in, in the changing rooms for fights, I would always have to be laughing and joking. And, and I'd be nervous, of course, and it was obviously a, a mechanism not to get not for the nerves to overwhelm me, you know? But most of the times, I would be, most for most of my fights, I'd have to be dragged back in the changing room because they would go, where's Barry? I don't know where he is. So I'd have my gloves on and I'd be off in the crowd talking to my friends. <laughs> and go, where's Barry? Or, or, or back at the back of the, the, back of the, the stalls where they used to have the little, pub, the little bars and the serving and you, kept, and you couldn't take drinks in. I'd be back there talking to my mates with all my gear on. Like, I'd be fighting in half an hour and then my trainer would go, what the fuck are you fucking, what are you doing? Get in, you got to warm up. I'm going, yeah, yeah, I've been warming up all day. I've like, been stretching, like, I always keep moving. I'm loose, I'm all right. I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to be fighting, just sit in the changing room and like, you know, get into the zone of, you know, like some fighters have to do and maybe, but maybe I would have been a better fighter if I would have done that, but it took me serious for, for 10 minutes. But my, that's the way it was back then. It was all, it was all just bizarre. My whole career was mad. I used to have to, I, I've, had to, I've had to drive the minibus home where all my mates got drunk and they couldn't so I, I fought and drove the minibus home I've been left behind in the middle of Wales after a pro fight I've had, to, I've, I've had to hitchhike home with my cash well, I got paid cash £750 of that cash in my pocket that's what I got for a six rounder back then my dressing gown on my shoulder my bag on my one I got left in bloody Tyler's town and I'm hitchhiking back on my own that was my career no glitz, <laughs> no glitz and glamour <laughs> Uh, what a career though. But do you know that you are the, you're the third person who, you know, who's retired and, and we've gone over their career. So you've just joined the list with the other two. Remember, we haven't been going for too long, but Larry Holmes did it and Michael Spinks did it. And now you've just joined that list, Barry. What, this for what? The list for going over your, your, your whole career, you know, from like the start to the, to the finish. Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, theirs must have been, yeah, but they, especially Witherspoon's career was massive. Not Witherspoon's, Michael Spinks and Larry Holmes. Oh, Larry Holmes, oh, bloody hell. Yep, so you're on that list, you're, you're, you're on that list with those two. Michael Spinks was on the show a couple of weeks back. I'm a little bit better than them, though. I no, really obviously. I mean, that goes without saying. <laughs> that goes without saying, that bit. Okay, listen, Barry, I want to get your opinion on a few upcoming fights. Um, I want to get yeah, your man. expert opinion. It was announced yesterday <laughs> that Box Nation have just picked up the Kovalev versus Chilemba fight. How do you see yeah. that one going, Barry? Oh, I think it's, a, it's an awkward fight because Chilemba's a nuisance, but he, he stops Chilemba, and I think, it, I think, I think, it's, I think Chilemba might see the sixth round if he's lucky, but... 
I don't see it going much further than that, to be honest. Yeah. I don't. I think Cobbler's yeah, got not. everything and a little bit more. Yeah, this, this distance and timing and he slides in and out. He's, he's, he's too good. He's too good. He doesn't feel very well because Andre Walls, you know, that, that fight's November now and you know, they, they, I think that's signed, signed, I think, for 19th of November if, I, if what I'm hearing is true. And uh, I find that a very hard fight to pick. Yeah, yeah, but me I've too. Seen, I've, seen on, I've, seen, I've, I've seen Andre Wall close up and the little the little movement I thought about in the comedy sometimes the little movement you almost wouldn't notice you know, when you're just watching the fight to enjoy it you just watch you just see the obvious skill things he makes little adjustments of his feet his distance you almost wouldn't notice or what, or what he does he's so clever Andre Ward so clever that he can maybe be clever enough to just take him, take the sting out of the punches of cover yeah that'd be a good pick, fight because you know, oh, it's, it's hard to pick him a better fight I think the, the pick a winner that, that's, that's for me the, is the most evenly matched fight you could you could possibly get yeah right now in boxing for me yeah 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 you're probably right that's and also a really some people, some people I think have, let's go on no go on go on go on finish off no I'll go on no, I'll talk all day otherwise as, as you're finding <laughs> out mate please <laughs> 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 And a really bizarre card. If anyone two years ago would have predicted that Rigondo would be fighting in Cardiff, Wales, you'd think they were crazy, but it's actually happening on July the 16th. How good is that for Welsh boxing, Barry, getting to see a genuine pound-for-pound pound great? And how much yourself are you looking forward to the whole card? I'm great. I must can't wait because when he was due to fight in Liverpool, I couldn't make it. I wasn't going to be working. I didn't work on that show in Liverpool. And I was so happy he didn't fight on there because... He's, an, he's just a fabulous fight to watch. And listen, he, he's been in some stinkers and he lets himself down, but when he's on form, he's beautiful to watch. And I think it's great for Welsh boxing. This this show, you know, in, in, in 16th of July, is very important for Welsh boxing because we haven't, there hasn't been, I know there was Lee Haskins box there recently, but there hasn't been a big Welsh show, you no, know, with a Welsh headliner, which it was originally with Liam Williams, since since uh, 2013, really. Oh, no, maybe there was. There was a... Um, Sky had a show, didn't he, with Shelby on then, and uh, and Gavin Reese was was boxing um, Gary Buckland, sorry. But the, the, the Wales is a hard sell, it always has been. I don't know why, it always has been, but a hard sell for big promoters. So I've been telling everyone I know that, listen, buy a ticket for this Welsh show, because it's a good show on paper, it's a stacked card, but if it don't sell out, the fact why I won't go back there again. He's been burned too many times. You know, going there, you know, he's had some fantastic nights there as well. But it's, he's had some. He's, he, the in recent years, he's been nothing but but blowouts, and also fairly hurt. He's had some blowouts there as well. So, you know, if you don't sell, if it doesn't, if it doesn't produce the crowds, they won't go. And now, because I'm listen, I'm a Welsh guy, so I want Welsh boxing to, to succeed above every other. Obviously, I'm, I'm patriotic about my about my about my sports, my country, and in sports. And so I wanted I wanted to be successful. I wanted to be a packed crowd. And Liam Williams, Gary Kokoran is, is a great... It, it was meant to be the top of the bill, but crowd-wise, it's the top of the bill, obviously. Not for TV-wise, because we're going to do it. And Jazza Dickens is a world title fight. But the williams Kokoran fight is a fabulous fight on paper. It's a, it's a genuine grudge match, because these are two kids who have, have, have engineered a row accidentally on Twitter. They're not kids who would do that. They're not, they're not that... They're, they're not that... Not, I would say quick but they're not those sort of kids. They're, they're proper normal guys where... They got a problem with you. They take your face, but they've had to do it through over Twitter, which is probably drove, driven them both mad. Because they're, they're just, both the sort of fellows would go, "Who are you looking at?" I look at you. Do I go outside? Come on in. And they do that. That's what they would do. Not all this back and forth banter they call it, whatever they call it, that banter, that weird word they use. You know, that's what's happened. So they want these. They want, and you see the press conference. They want each other up. You know, they and and they and they want it. And it's, so I think it makes it a, a really intriguing fight. Listen, William starts a favour because he's he's a champion and he's probably technically a better fighter than than, than Kukoran, But you know, Gary's tough and he's proved he's a better boxer than what people give him credit for. So you know I think it makes it it's, it'd be a hard fight and, a, and maybe it won't be fight of the year. Cause I think Conlon, the, the last Jamie Conlon fight is going to be hard to beat for me. Oh, that was a good fight. Yeah, that was a good fight. Yeah, it was something else, wasn't it? That was quality. That fight. Yeah, for us, for, for British boxing, that Rigondo in Britain is just fat. It's just tremendous. It really is. I just hope because I hope it turns out because Cubans are very temperamental and they can they can be fabulous and then they can be at the at the garbage, you know. And literally, that that just depends on how they how they feel on the day. Will that be the best yeah. fighter that you've commentated on? Well, live, 
Yeah. Or just, or just full stop. I don't know. I don't know. It's hard to say to you. You've got to try and think back. There's so many fights that it's hard to think what you think. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm forgetting you've done Lomachenko and a few others like that, of course. On Lomachenko. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Mayweather's. Mayweather's. You know, he's been something special. And it's hard to think. Um, but technically, he's, he's up there, isn't he? He might be, you know. He might yeah. be. I, I don't know. He's something else. I'm, I can't wait to see him. I'm excited. It'd be the best fight I've ever I've, I've done over here. That's for sure. Like by a million miles. There's no, there's no shame in that. Though Kovalev was pretty good. Mind you, we had him over here. Didn't we pick him up? Um, Nathan, Nathan Cleverly, Cleverly but, yeah. But yeah, so it's, it, it, I can't wait to see him. I tell you that much. I hope, I hope, I hope he turns up with with a purpose. But but I I hope, I also I almost hope he turns up in it like and it's rubbish. So Jason Dick, I want Jason. I want Jason to win. He's British, of course, and he's a lovely kid, Jason Dickens. An absolutely fabulous kid, he's just a real, just you couldn't pick a nicer fella. And for him to win this fight would just be, you know, one of the upsets of, well, in a British ring, to be honest. I couldn't, as upsets go, you know, it, it, it's, it, oh, it, it's hard to say it's up there with, with Curry and, and, and Ray Hunnigan. Hunnigan. I know that was, I know that was, but, or, or even, or even um, Stacey and, and Jose Napoli, because okay, they, they were great, but, they were this, they, they, them two on paper were better fighters than Jasper Dickens. So when you when you are, when you when you sort of weigh it up, how good they, their opponents were, how good how, how good they were thought of, and you know no one gives Jasper Dickens. I don't know what the what the bet is going to be with Jasper Dickens, but he got to be the biggest and one of the biggest underdogs you would find. So if he didn't win this fight, he would be one of the one of the best wins by any British boxer. It'd have to be. It would have to be. Yeah, definitely, really definitely. Good. Yeah, no, he's a nice guy. He's been on the show be, as well. Be, be a be, I'm not saying he's. Only, I'm not saying he's a better fighter than, than Scott Quigg. I'm not saying that Jesse Dickens would beat Scott Quigg or he would beat Cal Fanta because I don't think he would. No, the, the, the right now or whatever. But if he beats Rigondeau, that's a million times better than, than anyone that Fanta or Quigg would beat. Yeah, and that's the truth. No, no, that's yeah. the truth. You have to, if he beats him, you got. I know. I know that uh, Fanta's moved up and Quigg might be moving up now, but. If they were if they were super bad at me, no, you'd have to put you put Jazz Dickens way above him. If you beat you Rodondo, you'd have to, wouldn't you? You'd have to say he's, he's the best super super middle super band at me on the planet. Bam then. Yeah, you'd have to. We we'll, we'll have to wait and see though, but he's a good card. He's a good card. I hope <laughs> it's a good it's, yeah, it is. It is. It's, uh, I hope that there is a good turnout in Wales for it. Um, the last yeah, well, fight I, 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 I heard, I heard something. There's only five hundred. There's only five hundred tickets left. As I've heard. I don't know if that's true, but if that's if that is true, that's a that's good going. Yeah, yeah, no, it is. Hopefully, hopefully, yeah. I really do hope so. But the last boxing related question I want to ask you: Fury Klitschko obviously yeah, has man. been put off due to Fury's injury. Um, I, I don't know when it's going to get yeah. rescheduled before, but. What do you think about that fight? Well, they're talking about they're talking about late October, yeah. They're talking about yeah. late October. Um, well, well, to this way, the first fight, I didn't give Tyson Fury a hope in hell. No one did. I didn't think he had a chance. I thought, well, I thought he could be awkward. I couldn't even, I couldn't even paint, I couldn't even paint the scenario where he'd have any chance of winning. I thought once Klitschko just steps to the side or closes the gap, uses that front foot, gets him in the corner. Once he hits him, he hits him, and he, he puts, it, and, and then he stops him sometime. That's what I thought, and then. He boxed straight. Klitschko boxed terrible. But I think that's down to Fury. He boxed straight. And I think... And Fury kept saying... He said, Fury opens his mouth and just says whatever he wants to say. You know, sometimes he says, we don't know what he's going to say. He opens his mouth and noise comes out. But he said... He, I got him in his head. He scared me. He scared me. And, and, I, but he, and, and, Klitschko, and, and Klitschko boxed like somebody was scared. So maybe Fury was right. I don't know. You know maybe he is just a guy who, who intimidates him. I don't know. But... So you, I gotta go with Fury this time. I, I can't. This time I think I think if Klitschko can't be any worse, for God, I can't say he can't be any worse than he was that that night. I think if Tyson trains right, and if, I think if he's on, if he's in the right shape and in right, you know, right frame of mind, you know, ability wise, he, he's a fabulous move. I think his, his movement for the heavyweight is is hard to handle because of his size as well. I I gotta go with him. This time. I wouldn't I, I wouldn't be overly shocked if Klitschko just you know hit him with the right hand and put him to sleep either. To be fair, but. For me, I I still go, I go with the same sort of scenario. A bit, I mean, they're a tighter fight than than the, than the first, but I think Tyson's a little bit tougher than than, than what people might think. You know, he looks a bit vulnerable because he's so tall. When he gets hit, he looks sort of worse than hurt worse than he is at times. And as far as being knocked down, you haven't been knocked. People over exaggerate how many times he's been on the floor. 
oh, he's only gets it, he gets put down. He's, that's not the case, you know. He gets hurt and he's big, so he it, it looks more. And because he leans back with his chin up, it sometimes has, looks like looks worse than it is at times when he gets hit. But I, I got to go with Fury. I really have. Yeah, I hope so too. Right, that's it for the boxing questions, Barry. Just before I let you go, I wanted to ask you, how does it feel to be Welsh at the moment with Wales getting into the last four of the Euros, man? Do you know what? It, it is it is something else. It's, it really is like it's you, just, you can't explain it. It's just like happy to be there to the staff. No, I never. I, there's the two things I never thought I'd see in my lifetime, and that's Cardiff City, kind of Cardiff City fans and Cardiff City coming from Cardiff, obviously. Getting to the FA Cup final, that was just that just blew my mind. Like, well, what? I I couldn't. And Wales being in a major tournament, and this would have been. Like in 2004, I think it was Portugal. We almost qualified for Portugal, and I was going. I, you know, it was a few years there, and I had you no. Know, even though I had a daughter, but she was with I wasn't with her mother. And I was pretty much a, a long, a single guy. Pretty much, I had a girlfriend. I was a single guy, so I could. I was going to go. Obviously, now I've got another, another, I've got another family, another boy, and and a missus. So I can't just and a job. I've got a real job now, so I can't just step and leave. But I would have gone. This would have been. This would have been ten years. This would have been 2006. Now, 2016, I would be over there right now. I'd say that for nothing. I'm not a hooligan and all. I'd never into that sort of stuff, and, but I would be over there. I would know if the group matches, I probably would have spent all my money by then. I'm not, not going to afford to be over there right now, but I would have gone over just to see it. And, and I looked at the fights for Leon on Wednesday, but I'm not going to go. I, I'm working. Well, you know, I don't work every day, so when I work, I have to take it because the money's pretty good, you know. So I just don't have to. I don't, I'm not Steve Benson. I don't work every day. But... <laughs> So I work, I work Wednesdays. So I got, I got to, do, I got to work. Obviously, I got commitments. But I was thinking about driving out the car because they, they got big screens there. But if we get to the final, I booked the hotel in car. I'm not going to go to Paris. It's unrealistic, but I wouldn't get a ticket anyway. So I'm going to book the uh, hotel to go and go back home to Cardiff because they'll they'll be showing our fight with. I want to be with the uh, another 50, 60, 80,000 miles people watching that. You know, I think that's. No, listen. We we got a good chance against Portugal. I think I think we're going to miss Ramsey more, not more than we miss Bale. But he's been he's been a better player for us than anyone. I think he's been, been exceptional. His engine, he's just been great. Uh, Adam Ramsey, and we'll miss him. We'll miss him. But you know, we're we're a good unit. Everyone knows their job, and they stick by it. I'm not a football expert by no means, and no stretching the imagination. But they look good. You know, they look good against like Belgium. Like, I fancy I have fancy to beat Belgium until just before the match, and then they give their lineup of players, and you forget. I, I forgot. I forgot how many how many quality world class players Belgium has, and then I was shitting myself. And then for the first twenty minutes of the match, ten fifteen minutes of the match, I'm shitting myself more thinking this is going to be <laughs> like like I, was, I thought it was going to be like I, like Iceland and France. That's what I thought it was going to end up like. I thought we're going to get amateur now. It's going to be a humi- we've done so well to get there. That would have been enough, but. It's, it's going to be a humiliating defeat. And listen, and because and of because of because of what we are, because we don't have the strength and depth of, of other teams like say France does, well, that could that we could get to the final. We could get beat ten 0 in the final. We could, or we could, or we could win it two one. You know, like like we did like we did the other day. You know, it, I think it's like that. And you know, we've we surpassed ourselves in a, I mean, a team unit and Adam. Um, they they just you know they they're playing like Welsh people like they they say well Welsh boxers. There was no, we never had loads of quality in the eighties and stuff. You know. We had a few good ones, like Colin Jones, my my idol. But it was like, oh, they're tough, they're tough, the Welsh, they're tough, the Welsh. And, and like, you know, we're defending, like the Welsh rugby team defence. Bodies everywhere, you know, 100% we're committed there. Yeah. And if England had that, sort of, had that sort of bond, they would piss this tournament, to be honest. I'm not an English fan. I'm not an English sports fan. You know, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not anti-English either. No, if they had, because the quality they got on paper, England, with this, you know, if they had that same sort of, Unity that Wales have, who would beat them? I couldn't see it, but we have that. We have some. We have some. And maybe we have that that unity and that and that bond because we haven't got a band. We haven't got a team full of stars. You know, we got one star. I know, I know um, Ramsey should be a star, but we got one star. We got um, we got you know, one of the best players in the world. We got Bill, and even though we haven't, we haven't. I know he's got one of the top goal scorers, but he haven't set the tone with the light as such. But he's taking three players with him. Maybe he ties his laces up and he got two players around him. I mean, everyone should scare of him. So it, it, it gives a chance to some of our other players who are not nowhere near his level to to do their job. Like, but what do I know about football? Fuck all. All I know is that I'll be wearing red tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. 
I, I, t- I was just saying on Twitter the other day, this is um, for the quarter final against um, against Belgium. I said this is the biggest day in British football, in British football history, and I got absolutely slaughtered. <laughs> People go, you never heard the '66? I'm going, nah. The the '66 was never never really happened. Like the moon landing, they engineered it. <laughs> yeah, I see you've been get, you've been getting a bit lemon on Twitter lately, Barry. <laughs> yeah, I never know. This is from a guy I wouldn't go on it before. I wouldn't. I, I, my employers asked me to go on it, and I kept saying no. So I'm not going on that stuff. It's for kids. First of all, I said it's for kids. It's for kids that Twitter. What am I going for? What, what am I following a pop band around? I didn't understand what I didn't understand what it was for Twitter. And then, and then I um become addicted. And then I said, well, the first. The first person who strikes me off, I'm off it because I can't take it. Because again, I'm from, you know, like most of us, you know, we haven't all grown up in in, in you know, you, where I'm from. Someone someone calls you a name, you just call them a name, and then you and then you will come on in, and you have a fight. Yeah. You know what I mean? That's, that's what it is, isn't it? I don't know. Trickle, they argue all day. No, literally, you have, I mean, you're my size, by the way. You have fight, you have fights, you know, when you're going to get beat when you're small. You know what I mean? You can't go beating everyone up. I know, I know, I know when these fellas who, who goes, yeah, right, well, let's have it then. When I was younger. Because, because I could be dead when that, but I couldn't be dead when that. I was too small. Yeah. And, uh, but I, I, tell, I, I see the people come on the school side, and I'll beat you on points. <laughs> I can't, I can't fucking knock you out. <laughs> I was at, I was at, I was at the take, I was at the taking all your, po- all, all your, um, I was at the taking all your podcast up. I was at the fucking three hours now, wasn't it? I tell you, yeah, Barry. Um, uh, you know, <laughs> this week I was quite, I was quite worried because I was thinking there's not really because what we do is we talk about the fights that happened last weekend and the fights that are coming up this week and there's nothing on this week. There's barely anything to talk about. I thought it's only going to be a twenty minute show, <laughs> but you actually, I'm, this is the longest me, interview me. I've ever done. <laughs> Well, there you go. I've done one for two hours once with um, Ingram Jones. Really? Wow. Yeah. Well, I knew Ingram from we used, to, we used to live in Cardiff and train with me years ago. So we sat, we were out after the interview. We were just talking, oh, I remember we used to do this. And remember we did that? <laughs> Excellent yeah. stuff. But it's same with me. Well, I, I have a podcast, don't I? So we, as well, I'm not going to advertise because like, you know, it's, not, it's not fair, but there'll be ads for us now. Some of me and Punty tomorrow, we'll be ads for us to uh, nothing to talk about. Nothing to talk about. The Fury fights, but we will talk about the super professional boxers now who are in this tournament in Venezuela. In Venezuela, um, Amnet's running around, whatever his fucking name is, the former flyweight champion of the world. He's got through to the semi final, I think. And um, Hassan, Hassan Undam, who uh, lost to Peter Quillin for the WBO title, he's also uh, in this tournament to go to the Olympics. Oh, wow. He's got a fight no, coming. No, I think he's 16 for... No, I'm sure he has. He might have, but he's ended this tournament. He's in this tournament at light heavy. Oh, wow. And obviously, you know, he can't, he can't, he can't, he can't end with a middle weight because I don't know if there's any space left, but also, <laughs> once you get... If they do call for three, then basically they've got to make the weight before every fight. So they could have five fights in sort of 10 days. Well, he can't make middle weight, can he? It's like five times in 10 days. You know, so... And and the and the, the other kid, the room... And and that run run run, run wrong or run wrong I can't say it. you have to look it up I can't say it. <laughs> I've commented on two I've commented on two of his fights and I still can't say his name. He um he's a fly he's a flyweight I think he's gone at um welterweight or, or something like that him. So um it's disgusting though I hate it all that these pros boxing amateur and that, it, it ruins uh, it ruins the sport. But even like the WSB and and all that they're brilliant tournaments and they're great for these kids to earn money. But it ruins. It's killing our sport from the inside out. Amateur boxing was always a constant. You win the ABA, and you go, you go, you 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 box for your country and things like that. You know, you knew what was what. And and we're, we're and we're thanks to the academy in Sheffield, we got some the, the most successful that we know in Great Britain for amateurs. They were doing so well. We're just we're one of the best countries out there. It's it's tremendous and it's great. But all these WSB stuff, which is brilliant to watch. WSB is such a great tournament to watch. It really is. I'd recommend it for anyone. When when the, when the British Lionheart is in the York Hall, you've got to go and watch it. I tell, I tell you that. It's like seeing world-class amateur boxers who turn pro boxing other world-class amateur boxers who turn pro. You'd never see it anywhere else. And over five rounds it is with no vests and you know it's proper fighting. But it's so fractions to sport. You know, professional boxing has always been the one that... that you know, like a jumble sale, we don't know who's the world champion and how many titles they are and 
who's in the super champions now, you know, WBA got three champions in one weight and, and all this shit. You know, but to be amateur boxing, you knew what you you knew what you had there, but now you don't know what you got anymore. I don't know if you, are you amateur, you pro, you APD, you were ten rounds, but you still go to the Olympics. You WSB, you were five rounds, and you turn pro, you do four rounds. It don't make any sense. The game has changed a lot. The game has changed a lot. Okay, Barry, listen. I'd like Fuck to off, thank I'm you. Finished. I got hours. I got hours. I got hours. I, got hours. So I my, can't. I, I, Congratulations. I had my second fight when I, I had my second fight when I was 10. I remember that. Right? <laughs> Dominic, Dominic Ahern, I think. Dominic Ahern from Grange Catholic, I was. He's from Grange, some bronze kid. Yeah. And I threw a left hook and I, and I missed that. I don't, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, <didn't you> know? <laughs> <laughs> All right, Barry. Listen, congratulations on um, you know becoming the, the the longest interview we've done. I can't even remember who's second. No one's come close to an hour anyway. But it's been an hour with Barry Jones. Listen, like oh, I say, thank sorry, you. I'm sorry, Fa- sorry, no, mate, no, no, sorry, you, Joe. Listen, you've done me a big favour. You've you filled in a lot of space this week. Thank you for giving us a bit of time, okay. and it's been an absolute pleasure. Uh, speaking you're my, to you, you're, of my course, you're my mate. You're my mate, didn't you? What am I going to do? Say no to you? Exactly, mm-hmm. exactly. That's what it was like, you know. It was quite. Sometimes I get a little bit nervous before an interview. No nerves whatsoever. It's, it's my good old mate Barry Jones. Yeah, man. I'll see you soon, Joe. I'll see you on the next one. See you on the next show, mate. Take it easy, yeah. Nice one, pal. Okay, now it's time to conclude episode forty of the Box Hard Podcast. I've been your host, Joey Coastman. I as summer has been I as summer. A massive thank you to our two guests on this week's show. As always, really, um, Jamel Herring. It's it's always a pleasure to speak with him. A true gentleman, and I'm really happy to hear that he's in good spirits after his defeat over the weekend. I was gutted for him, but he sounds like he's in a good place, and that's the important thing. And I know that he will come back, you know, bigger and better than before. And I cannot wait for that so thank you very much to Jamil Herring and also to Barry Jones we were struggling we didn't know what we were going to do it was only a short review the part one was really short we'd done the Jamil Herring interview part two there wasn't too much to to preview we done the other little segments that we do on this show now and we were thinking gosh we really need someone to come on and talk quite a bit and Barry Jones come and delivered so I'm very happy about that he talked about a lot of stuff in his career you know a lot of deep stuff a lot of stuff that a lot of people wouldn't have known and it was a it was a real pleasure hearing all that from Barry Jones of course again another true gentleman this show this week has really featured nothing but gentlemen Barry Jones, one of the nicest guys in boxing, I've said it for a long, long time, and Jamel Herring, a real, real, real nice guy from over in the States. So it's been a pleasure bringing you this show this week. It's been filled with a lot of love. And again, if you want to reach out to us on Twitter, you can find us on Twitter at Box Hard Podcast. We'll be back next week with another big show, as always. Thank you for listening once again, and we'll see you next week.